Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to what I think is actually the first emergent session of the Open Science Room um, for the OHPM 2020 meeting. Um, so it's a real pleasure for me to welcome everyone here, especially our guests on this, um, on this call. Um, so this emergent session, well, first quick uh, overview of what an emergent session is. Um, it's basically emergent, so it, it arises out of discussion, uh, usually at an in-person conference. So what people typically call unconference sessions, um, uh, people are interested in the same idea uh, and they start discussing over coffee or over um, water or whatever. And they say, okay, let's just find a time and, and, and talk about this and maybe we can start collaborating. So this is that idea, um, although it's not um, as un unconferency uh, as usual. So we put a lot of effort in um, like prior to this, um, to, to get everything um, in place. And um, um, the topic here today is um, we're discussing open data sharing and uh, the GDPR or data privacy, or uh, GDPR is, is something specific in that um, to the domain, but data privacy in general as well. And we're trying to find some, some crossover between um, caring a lot about the privacy of, of individuals um, and making sure that is an important feature in research, but also balancing that with um, sharing data and, and, and sharing data for the purposes of um, reproducibility and uh, um, fostering trust in, in, in research outputs, um, et cetera. So that's the topic. Uh, my name is Stefan Yenis, and I am a, a PhD candidate working with uh, fMRI data and, and um, um, open and transparent uh, science practices uh, in the Netherlands. And I will ask all my um, co-speakers um, uh, here to just uh, share a bit about themselves before we start with the, with the topics. So first up is uh, Emma Blumke. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. Um, I presented at OHBM last year on some work uh, predicting age from brain images, which is the first step um, for me in my journey of realizing what kind of data can be extracted from seemingly anonymized uh, data. Um, and at the same time, I knew Andrew Trask, uh, who started an organization called Open Mind, which is an open source organization. And I knew that uh, those tools would allow you to essentially preserve the privacy of that data and, and work on that data without making copies. Um, and I was surprised that no one was really talking about this uh, uh, at OHBM last year. So I got really involved with Open Mind in my spare time this year. And um, I thought that it'd be quite useful to have someone from the outside the neuroimaging community and from the privacy preserving technology community come in on this panel. Thanks. Well, maybe since you uh, kind of introduced Andrew, maybe Andrew, you can say something about yourself. Yeah, sure. So, uh, hi, my name is Andrew. I'm here here with Emma. Um, I lead Open Mind. Um, we focus on privacy enhancing technologies, and specifically, we're, we're uh, spending a lot of time thinking about this issue of how do you work with data that you can't see and be able to sort of extract results from these data sets while keeping the individual records and the people that they represent uh, uh, private. So, yeah, happy happy to to join. I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Uh, next up is Liubar Tsail. Hi, my name is Liubar. I'm a postdoc working at the research center in Jülich in Germany. And I'm a member of the Human Brain Project, the HPP, uh, of the curation team and dealing mainly with human data. And because of that, I'm part of the uh, data protection group of the HPP and we are trying to coordinate the access to GDPR sensitive data and putting everything in place for that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Michael. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Michael. I'm at the Center of Genomics and Policy at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Um, I also head up the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health um, uh, GDPR form. Um, so I focus on uh, health, genomic and health related data, but from a legal lens. So how is it viewed through uh, specifically European data protection law, but also to a lesser extent, uh, Canadian data protection law. Thanks. 
Uh, we just had someone join us there, uh, but I'll ask uh, Gustav to introduce himself next. Thanks, Stefan. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist uh, at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. I've been working with brain imaging for about 10 years, and uh, I've tried a number of my own data sets, both imaging data sets and, uh, and others. And I also have a role now uh, affiliated to the Swedish National Data Service, where I try to advise colleagues and uh, give uh, courses and workshops on uh, data sharing. Thanks. Next up is uh, Rubes Welsh. Hi, yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, finishing up my PhD now at the VU in Amsterdam, and um, I'm about to start a postdoc where I'll be working with, uh, so in, in, the, in my role here, I've worked with some pretty sensitive data and it's, uh, none of it has been opened um, for that reason. Um, and the project that I'm looking forward to in Toronto has required me to really dig into how do we go about handling this problem of um, you know, you have a very, very small minority group. We're talking about trans people, um, represents a tiny proportion of the population. If you can identify their age from a brain imaging scan, as Emma was talking about earlier, for example, that can't be anonymized. Um, and of course, uh, Canada isn't the US, but like earlier in um, this project, we were collecting data from people in the US and deliberately storing it on European servers because I was a bit like, I don't know about that guy in that in that big house. Um, I don't know if I trust if I if, you know if I want it to be somewhere where uh, the US authorities can access it. So I think that that's a solution that was available to me because of my location in the Netherlands. Um, that solution will not be available to everyone, and I think we have to think very carefully about how do we consider the um, political sensitivity of the position of a particular group when we study them and what it means to be studying a group and then what you know in what way do that does their data belong to them and, and, and what does that mean so that's why i'm coming from cool thanks uh next up is peer uh, hi. thanks for having me uh I'm a postdoc at the Montreal Neurological Institute in Montreal, Canada. And before that, I was situated in Germany, where I was also, let's say, affected by GDPR because I wanted to share my data and it was not possible. And based on that, uh, Stefan and some other great people and I got together and started adapting the infamous open brain consent form for uh, GDPR. Cool. Thanks, Peter. Uh, next up, uh, Jonathan. Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan, I'm based in London, UK. Um, I've, been, I've been a computer scientist involved in, uh, in the, the group Biomedia and leading the efforts of uh, data sharing and data processing for the Developing Human Connectome Project, which is a collaboration we, we're doing here with uh, Oxford and, and King's College. And when I've, when I've started working on, on these data sharing policies for, uh, for the DHCP project, I've uh, quickly been frustrated with the, the discrepancy between what's possible uh, from a legal standpoint and what I wanted to ideally implement to, to foster and encourage uh, sharing this data even further. And that's almost at the same time that I met Andrew and also started to, to get involved and interested in, in everything related to privacy preserving machine learning which is now my main uh, focus uh, at uh, a startup called Consensus Health, where I lead the, the research efforts around uh, applying privacy preserving computations and the, how to link uh, these new technologies with uh, all, the, all the permissions and incentives we can implement with uh, a technology called blockchain. Cool, thank you. Uh, Tonya, could you introduce yourself? I'm gonna unmute you. There, you can speak. Oh, okay. Um, hello everyone, Tanya White. I'm an associate professor at uh, Rasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And um, several years ago, actually it was about three years ago, I had a, a large grant from the National Institutes of Drug Abuse um, for our population or imaging study. And we were planning to share data. And um, and this was just before the GDPR went into effect. And um, so um, we were 
told that it would work out if we could navigate uh, data sharing um, under the GDPR. So I spent a couple years working with one of our attorneys in the technology transfer office to try and figure out, navigate the issues and read the document several times, so twice in Dutch and once in English. And, um, and it, it turned out that um, it looked like it was very much a doable thing that if you take appropriate precautions and the primary thing was um, was really consent, making sure you were very clear on the consent issues and what you said. Um, it went to the, uh, to the dean and so then, you know, there, there was the, um, the attorneys at a university, um, their job is to protect the university. And so then you have this balance between um, protecting the university and open science. And so the Dean made the decision and um, not to accept the grant. So, um, but I'm still convinced that, that it is possible. And I think perhaps the key issue and perhaps I think one of the key um, strengths of the GDPR is it actually gives control back to the participants who then can make the decisions about their own data. So I, I see consent as actually probably the, the biggest point and that we as researchers um, should give participants the option to share their data if they want to rather than taking a pejorative stance that you know we make a decision for them. Of course, the decision is within the safeguards of the rules, uh, the GDPR, and of course the penalties fall on the universities. So it's a bit of a balance. So that's kind of my story. Thanks. And the last introduction uh, is Adam Thomas. Hi there, thank you. Sorry I was late. No um, my, my name is Adam Thomas. I lead the data science and sharing team at the NIMH intramural program in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, we're a small group that sort of deals with data sharing issues, uh, both, uh, both putting them out and uh, both putting data out from our group, as well as um, uh, trying to help researchers get access to data. And uh, we, uh, we work for that uh, man in the big house that was being referred to earlier. So um, we were uh, constantly navigating some of those challenges. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thanks. Okay, so now we know everyone. Um, I think maybe we can start. Um, so we've been referring a number of times between this balance that has to be struck between protecting the participants and um, and open sharing. And, 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 and so I was wondering if we can speak about two points in that regard. The one is like uh, from a research perspective, some of us have, have been in this position of collecting data and wanting to share it. Uh, and maybe we can speak a bit about like the explicit um, uh, roadblocks on that road um, and try to see how that can help us navigate um, from the other point of view, which is then to um, wh why um, or how are we considering consent um, and the protection of the, the individuals. So maybe um, uh, I was wondering, Tonya, if you could refer back to, to your roadblocks um, in terms of collecting that data and maybe some of you who've done the same uh, can jump in. When you when you speak about you you collect the data, did you have problems before when you were designing the study, when you were designing it for sharing or not? Was it only afterwards? And what specifically were the points referred to that made um, that led to the decision of not being able to share it? So the um, we we would not have been able. It's a longitudinal study, so we have a, um, that gives us a benefit because we can. Um, change the consent form for future waves to fit the GDPR, we would not have been able to share without reconsenting based on our earlier consent form. So, um, but since it's a longitudinal study, the plan is, and actually we did incorporate um, uh, terminology that would allow sharing under the GDPR in our new consent form for our wave that will start after the, the hopefully the COVID uh, issue. We haven't started collecting our next wave because of um, unable to do that because of the lockdown or the Is that something that, that other people have? So Sorry, we I'm... had to change our terminology to allow for data sharing. Is that something that other people have uh, encountered like um, 
uh, like it's easier to, to to share the data if you plan ahead of, of the actual study compared to like um, trying to sh share data that exists. <laughs> A lot of head nods, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so yeah. um, sorry. Go. Uh, was it was it beer? It was me. <laughs> ah, sorry. sorry. Uh, I should have used it. the hand up thing. Um, oh, thanks. So with, with the um, with the project I mentioned earlier, the the online part, we um, we ex we expressly wanted to make it as open a project as possible. That 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 was sort of part of the point was that um, in the in the field there, there's not a lot of open um, going on in in that area of science right now. And so we were trying to kind of push the envelope a bit with that project. And um, so we were planning from the outset, uh, unlike with the larger project, um, where it was more of an afterthought to try and incorporate it. And by that point, GDPR meant that we couldn't really. Um, so the problem that then arose was that we had, um, but it, it comes back to this thing about the sensitivity of the data and the ability to fully de-identify somebody um, when you're talking about a minority group. And I, I, I think there's probably something Andrew said earlier kind of made me think maybe there's, a, maybe there's a way around this problem of being able to run an analysis without ever accessing the data itself, uh, like directly. But um, in the media term, what, what, what we ended up doing was saying we would um, we would have a you know a, a protocol by which individual researchers could gain access um, to the data, um, which obviously was in the, then in the, then in the consent agreement. But it's um, it's so I, I suppose what I want to say is just that it's when when you don't do it up front when you when you aren't planning ahead that it's going to be open, it's you you're 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 going to get stuck, mm -hmm. <laughs> and if and if you are you still might. Um, <laughs> the current state of affairs is it's very difficult to ethically and legally um, do this, but I also think we do we do have an ethical imperative to try and do it, not just from the point of view of um, you know making the most out of participants' data, but also which researchers get access to how much data and of, of what type. Because at mm. the moment, if you look at say the geographical distribution of the people um, who would attend OHBM events, etc. We're we're all global north, pretty much, not exclusively, but you know, there's there's a definite bias there, and I think some of that could really be alleviated by open data. But in the medium term, I don't. Mm. Yeah, uh, Luba, you wanted to comment. Um. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um. So. Uh, I mean. I'm part of the human brain project curation team. So meaning I receive most of the data. So I'm in the position of getting a lot of data and then supposed to share them with the world. Um, but I'm also of course in personal contact with a lot of data providers. And the consent form was a particular issue we have with the GDPRs because a lot of these consent forms were of course collected before GDPR took place. And now these data are supposed to be shared and we are dealing with the fact on how to deal with this if they are not completely conform or if there is a mismatch between the consent form and the supposed license they should get. And um, like uh, from my point of view, I have the feeling that this is particularly um, difficult for data providers to deal with these changes and also in particular with depending on what service you're using, how conservative they are dealing with GDPRs. Considering, and that was like mentioned before, the fact of what is de-identification, like what is necessary to be called anonymous. And in our case, for example, we decided to be conservative. So meaning all human data of living humans that are not aggravated are considered GDPR sensitive. So none of our raw data or derived data that are coming originating from one single subject is currently available through our systems, which is of course a bit of a pity, but also I think our responsibility to take care that we deal with this. So, um, can I ask you, 
um, am I muted? Yeah. Um, a question about the decision, your decision to say that it was, you couldn't fully anonymize it. So, because that's a debate that we've had as well. If you have enough data, then, then at a certain point in time, you can say it can't really be fully anonymized. So do you have, is it that you have lots of, just a, a large amounts of data that, or how did, how did you come to that decision? So in our case, we like we started from the assumption that anonymization is, for example, dealt with by using generalized IDs, by defacing particular imaging data and so on. Um, but then GDPR arises and in principle, every little risk, might it, not, might it be as little as it seems, is a supposed risk of uh, uh, re-identification. So meaning all imaging data from raw patients were out since uh, Wilkie and Jury can be potentially used to re-identify a person if you have the necessary means. And then the second question arised, uh, isn't that also possible with electrophysiology data? Might it not be possible to use brain waves in order to figure out the personal uh, person of, of um, of the, or the subject. And then uh, our attorneys decided that if there is a potential risk, might it be as low as it is, we consider it as GDPR sensitive. So um, uh, that, that was our decision. That's my, why I say we dealt with this very conservatively, um, considering the first access routes. Um, I think um, uh, Emma wanted to jump in a, uh, with, with a note on that. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm coming from the medical imaging community. You know, I've always had this issue of either not enough access to data or, you know, we want to diversify it and build larger data sets, but that just opens up more people, possibly more vulnerable people to being identified. Um, and we also have no idea what in five years from now we can pull out of this data, right? We're just starting to see with like DNA phenotyping that you can reconstruct somebody's face uh, and all as well, all of our face is linked to our uh, online profiles and our you know internet history and all this, right? So I think we, the solution, I don't think we're gonna get to a point, well, this is just my personal opinion. I don't know if it, we will ever know what fully anonymized would be and what would be dangerous and not dangerous data. Um, and that's why I was so excited to see when, when Andrew's talk and he just explained, well, actually the to share or not to share, it, it doesn't have to be the problem anymore. You can perform operations on, on your data remotely and you never have to make copies of the data. So, so that data can just stay with your organization or whoever originally collected that. And we can still perform stats on it just by using new tools that other people are doing. So, so, you know, Google researchers, Apple researchers are already using this on our phones, right? There's a lot of the, this technology is already quite well established. Um, and what open mind is doing is just making it free. So obviously we're all, you know, MRI people or neuroscientists. We don't have time to then learn differential privacy or learn how to, how to do cryptography on the side. Um, and so basically just by using these free open source libraries, we could, we could actually solve this problem for ourselves, which would give us like more diverse data sets, you know, preserve the safety of everybody involved. We future proof ourselves, right? Against whatever could be at, at attacks in the future, whatever these could be linked to from linkage attacks. But so, so that, um, you, could also, open you could also let you use uh, all the consent forms. Like if you didn't get consent to share the data, then like presumably if you aren't sharing the data and you're only sharing, you know, high level statistics, which is what it sounded like uh, the constraint was. Um, um, that could potentially open up data sets that just, that just you, know, you can't reconsent. Um, I have a and quick comment from uh, Jonathan on the on Emma's uh, description. Yes. Yeah, I think I think to, to supplement what Emma and was just saying, uh, and, and probably that the, the people who are more involved in, in GDPR and the implications can can comment on that. But one thing that I've uh, found particularly difficult when we were sharing the the DHCP data set is that. Uh, dealing with uh, patient withdrawal from the study, where the best thing you can do is just send out an email to everyone who's, has, who's had access to the data set and ask them to kindly delete it. Well, now if you can't see the data in the first place, you, you can just like implement this feature in a, in a, in a much more future-proof way. And that's the, kind of, uh, that's the kind of features that you can add 
uh, using, well, the, the, the kind of technology that Open Money is providing, but also combining that with, uh, with another set of tools. And, and I, I think in particular with the blockchain is in the concept of tokenization of data, but we can come back to that later maybe. And, and just Thanks. to clarify, the, the sort of technology that Open Mind generally works on, it's not blockchain, uh, it's not related to blockchain. However, it can be partnered, which, which is what Consensus Health is working on. Um, but just to clarify. Thanks. Um, on, the, on the question of um, to share or not to share versus to share and within that distinct, uh, making a, distinguish, uh, a distinction between um, like what is fine to share and what is not. Maybe Gustav, you can comment on that uh, because I, and I know from, from your experience, you had some, um, some interesting points on that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, um, I'd like to start by agreeing with the uh, Rubes uh, that uh, if you don't know what you're going to do, then you will get stuck. Uh, and I have got stuck uh, many times. Uh, but I have to say that many of the things that I got stuck on in the past now have solutions, particularly how to find good data standards and suitable repositories. And uh, in my view, most of, the, most of the technical challenges are fairly well solved and, and what is mainly causing problems for, for me and my colleagues are the legal and ethical challenges, which is probably emblematic of the discussion we're having right now as well. And um, to that point, I would like to uh, start by uh, making the point that uh, we always need to weigh the risks and the benefits uh, whenever we do something to human participants. And uh, uh, they have a rightful expectation that we will extract the most uh, scientific benefit of the data that uh, that they contribute to. So not only do we have a responsibility to safeguard their data, but we also have a responsibility to make sure that their data can actually be used. Um, and here I'd like to be a little bit contrarian maybe and, uh, and suggest that uh, I don't think that anatomical uh, T1 uh, scans defaced uh, are typically uh, re-identifiable in the GDPR sense. Uh, this is something that someone should uh, try to analyze uh, formally, uh, trying to look at the entropy of uh, <laughs> the, the, the information in the images and the information that is out there, as it were. But it, to, do, to perform a re-identification, you need to have the study data set and the reference data set of MRI images. And I think in most cases, uh, it is not possible to identify a reference data set. And if you did, it would not be possible to make um, a... Uh, um, reliable uh, matching. I mean, you, if you think about what kind of situation would lead to something like that, it would probably be either someone within the university that is uh, leaking the data or a large scale breach of medical records that contain imaging data. Uh, in which case, uh, the next question is, is there something in the medical data that, it, um, sorry, is there something in the academic, in the study data that is more sensitive than what you can already find in the medical records? Uh, and I think uh, probably not in the vast majority of cases. So I have a fear that we're becoming too restrictive uh, and therefore doing science and our participants a disservice. Uh, that said, I, I'm also very much in favor of finding a better means of, of sharing intermediate data steps uh, where we have a low risk of the identification and we're moving to federated analysis systems in the future where someone else can hold the data and I can send the code. Uh, uh, I, I strongly support that kind of work as well. Right. Thanks. Um, I think uh, Michael had a comment earlier on, and maybe also in response to Gustav's uh, comment. Lots of lots of thread to pick up on. Um, I think going to the identification point, it's interesting in uh, uh, Yuba and also to Tanya's point about kind of how uh, you know the GDPR finds a very scary you know the gdpr is kind of drafted to deal with facebook and and, and google and these very large companies um you know millions of euros four percent of global turnover and so i think that this has made you know kind of everyone become very afraid of sharing data even though very kind of rational proportionate safeguards are going to be used but then unfortunately at the same time we have, you know, the European Data Protection Board, who's kind of the, the key uh, body responsible for ensuring consistency of interpretation and application 
of the GDPR across the European normative space um, is unable to give a lot of definitive guidance for kind of data protection issues as it applies to scientific research, because unfortunately many provisions fall on the member states to figure out within their own national law. So unfortunately we have this regulation that then, which is meant to you know, apply uniformly across Europe, but then when it comes to scientific research, we see that you know, researchers in Ireland are basically subject to a completely different regime than those in Finland. Like in Ireland, you have to use consent as your legal basis if you're going to be processing data, like health data for research purposes. Whereas in the UK, just you know, across the, the sea, they're saying that uh, the, the UK Information Commissioner's Office actually recommends not using consent as the legal basis for processing data for scientific research purposes. So it's, um, it's very difficult and yeah, I mean, I'm definitely down for talking more about kind of issues with consent and also distinguishing ethics consent from data protection consent, because I think that this is something that um, I've noticed that the neuroscience community seems to be working out, but this is something which kind of the genomics community has had a bit more time to kind of think about and um, how to figure out how to kind of share data more openly, but also just face the GDPR in general. Thanks. Um, I was thinking on those comments, Pierre, if you could maybe talk a bit about the open brain consent and because uh, the type of challenges that, that I've faced there are similar to uh, what Michael mentioned, like should, which legal basis do you choose to uh, process the data, process and share, um, and what type of level of consent is, is enough yeah, I think like actually like our work we did on the uh, open brain consent form and adapting it to GDPR perfectly summarizes or actually entails all of the points we were talking about so far. Because so for those of you who not know the open brain consent form, it's a great initiative that was started uh, a good while back to make, as they say, uh, data sharing a no brainer for ethics committees. So it was tend to be a form, a consent form that everyone in the world, because it was translated to a bunch of languages, could use exactly in that form, allowing them to um, get consent from participants to share the data. Obviously, this was uh, uh, created and started in the US. So when GDPR came along, we could not use this form anymore. So uh, Stefan and I um, and other people, as already mentioned, started adapting it to that. And based on that, we had, I would say, uh, and still have a very wild adventure because we have to tackle in this form to make it somewhat GDPR compliant, all of these things, going from the ethical aspects to legal aspects to uh, technical aspects. It's all entailed in there. So like, for example, one thing going back to the anonymization part, what we know from what we heard um, and all the uh, people we've talked to on the GDPR, neuromaging data will always be personal data and this was already uh, sensitive and it can never be um, fully anonymized this is not a thing apparently it can only at best pseudo non pseudo anonymized maybe um and this is like a very like specific wording thing like a term thing we would have to um like put in there at, at step up yeah i was thinking on that point of anonymization and and also the point that uh, michael made about the different uh, jurisdictions and, and interpretations because it i mean it even varies within the same country and different institutions um so uh, there was an interesting um study or or a preprint on uh, by archive peer that you shared recently where uh, Big-ish um, data set, I think it's about 900 uh, participants that was shared from um, Amsterdam. Um, and as far as I uh, understand, and please anyone correct me here if I'm wrong, is that it was deemed to be anonymous by the local data protection office and hence also shared on uh, Open Nero. So um, I'm interested in hearing some some thoughts about that because it's a, I mean, it's a real world uh, example of how we can kind of explore what what the different interpretations are and what people consider to be anonymous or not and one one more question is if we think about the no i'll i'll, I'll 
I'll table that for, for after this. So yeah, once, you, <laughs> once you jump in. Uh, I mean, that example is actually it's, it's very good in, in a lot of further points, right? It's, first of all, it's about the anonymization that the data protection officer deems it uh, GDPR compliant and that's okay to share. But um, the next thing that comes up, it was shared on uh, Open Euro, which is a great, and in my uh, opinion, the uh, platform for creating your emerging data. And um, the problem is that the problem, it's the servers are hosted in the US and based on GDPR, as far as we know, again, we're not allowed to put our data and share our data on servers outside Europe or like repositories. Going into the next problem that every data set on uh, Open Euro was licensed on a CC by zero. And what, based on our uh, research we did, um, we cannot put such a license on data we get from third parties, but it should be a different data set. So there are a lot of things um, that we for and still think or seem to know that are not GDPR compliant, but it's also the first data set like we are aware of that um, that is out there and like on the GDPR put there on Open Euro and I think, I mean, I certainly hope that no one will ever complain about that and there will be no problems, but it makes a very interesting case for um, everything we talk about basically. Uh, Rubes, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, so um, with, uh, with our project one, uh, the project, the one that's not super vulnerable participants, um, a lot of that data was temporarily stored on servers in the US um, for pragmatic reasons. And um, we simply just put it in the consent form. We, we, we put in the consent form, the data will temporarily be stored and um and that was deemed by the lawyers at the VU to be GDPR compliant. Um it did it did scare some participants a bit because we 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 literally had to kind of like under GDPR you do kind of have to articulate that point that theoretically if it's in the US the US government can access it. Um, but yeah consenting to that seemed to be sufficient um, uh, at least in the Netherlands, but as you say, the, the laws can vary across a soft border. So, mm -hmm. um, and that was in paper. That was before the actual study was carried out. So it's not existing data, right? Yes, we got the consent. We got uh, we, we included that in the consent form. Um, well, the very first wave of data collection was before GDPR came into force. So it wasn't okay. uh, it wasn't in the first wave. But then we we consented. What time you were describing? Okay, uh, Michael, you had a comment on that. Yes. Um, so international transfers under the GDPR are also something that's very kind of uh, difficult. And I'm, I'd be curious to know Ruth, more about this project, maybe offline, um, because you know the wording of the GDPR says that you're not meant to use consent for habitual transfers of data outside of the European Union if you can't rely on like an adequacy decision. So like something where the European Commission says, for example, you can transfer Europeans data to Argentina and they have an essentially equivalent data protection regime as that in Europe. So it poses all of these questions of like, we need to consider like where exactly is the data going and we need to tell participants of these risks, both from, an, and this is true, you know, the ethical perspective, but also the kind of GDPR perspective here. And I think that um, to your earlier point as well, Ruth, about vulnerable populations, I think that this is really essential to consider um, and how, you know, access by authorities is actually a really key concern from your, you know, European policy makers and law makers, um, where you know, in Canada, for example, we had uh, the former head of the, the, the European Data Protection Supervisor, Giovanni Buttarelli, tell our parliament that um, when it came to modernizing our own data protection regime in Canada to maintain Canada's GDPR adequacy, that a key concern from the European point of view would be access by uh, you know, like security services and these sorts of things. And it's really, um, 
difficult where we're also interconnected and, and all of a sudden researchers have to start giving consideration to, okay, is the, you know, like NSA going to have access to this data or other US enforcement, like law enforcement officials going to have access to data held in US servers. Um, so it's all very kind of difficult, but again, it's like a proportionate response is always kind of going to be merited. So, so um, to be even more pessimistic on that, I actually know of a firm in the States um, whose sole business model is to buy up anonymized data and uh, sell marketing insights to like insurance companies. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like, ooh, it happens accidentally sometimes or ooh, it's, you know, like weird political process. Like there are people who do this repeatedly and it's like, and, and I, don't, I don't think that their, their uh, forward-facing marketing would, would indicate that as much, but, um, but um, yeah, and this is, this is, but this is also why um, remote training or remote statistics for data is, is both a huge boon for, um, for the availability of data, but also for the privacy and access. Like, you know, it, you, you don't have to ask for nearly as much consent if you're gonna maintain control over the only copy of their information, right? Like that, it's just, a, it's just an easier ask. And, and simultaneously, all these data sets that are in organizations all around the world that are locked up both for legal and commercial reasons um, could be could be unlocked. I mean, this is the kind of thing where if if this technology became mainstream, if we if we were using it regularly, this is a hundred thousand x you know more data that's available for for various scientific um, experimentation just by virtue of the fact that we can access data and uh, that's distributed across multiple different organizations. Um, in particular, I think the commercial aspect is also really undervalued. So, if you're a commercial entity, so even not, like think not not academics, so I think like you know big hospitals, big pharma, this kind of stuff, um, um, you have an incentive not to share your data that's financial because every every person you share it with then becomes a competitor in the marketplace and like just decreasing the value. Whereas if we make it possible to perfectly protect privacy, uh, uh, to to work with data um, that is, you know, only has a single owner, right, who's, who's maintaining control over that, that information, um, it also changes the economics because it means that the more people that work with your data, the more people that verify that it's really valuable, that it's useful for, you know, that it's predictive of lots of interesting things, um, the more valuable it becomes. Um, um, and so the, the, the economics of working with more people actually actually flip around. So like for, for commercial entities right now, there's a financial incentive not to share data. There's a financial incentive not to work with other individuals. Whereas if, if we can sort of make robust um, this technology for being able to work with data without having to receive a copy, the, the financial incentives flip so that it's, it's actually most profitable to be as highly collaborative as, as, as you can. Um, so it's, it's really, it's really a story of being able to have your cake and eat it too. Like, like with, with, with the ability to, to do statistics on data that you can't see data that's not yours. Um, um, you both get, you get, you get better, you know, better legal protections. You, you're, ha you're hampered less by red tape. You get access to more data and, and better business models for both data providers and data scientists. Um, so it's, it's sort of, you know, better for patients, better for science, um, uh, better for regulators uh, all around. Thanks, Andrew. I, I want to get back to your point and we have a question on that as well, but I just want to check in with Liuba if you had a comment, uh, Sorry, you're still. Uh, you're muted, Liba. Uh, where are you? Still muted. Yeah, still muted. Ah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, my, my comment, I think, got a bit lost in, in the conversation <laughs> now. But um, so uh, I'm very interested in this um, not re like not getting the copy of the data, but still being able to work with this. And um, this is also what we imply with the Human Brain Project. We have the medical information platform, which is exactly doing this on high sensitive GDPR data. But um, with a lot of science data, I think it's actually beneficial if you really have them at hand and work with them. So and also because it gives you better insights of the data themselves. That's my personal opinion about this. Working with high complex data sets, I wouldn't be able to address the research questions if I wouldn't have had them at hand. But um, from our perspective, like these low GDPR sensitive data, what we are currently implementing is just an authentication login. So as a data repository, we say, you still can get access to the data, but you have to authenticate yourself. So we are putting up the responsibility 
partially on the data provider in order to pseudonymize and anonymize as best as they can their data. And the other part we push onto the data user by saying you can only have access to those data if you authenticate yourself and agree to the terms of use that is part of this uh, authentication lock-in. And I think from the legal perspective or from the GDPR perspective, this is sufficient. At least that's our plan at the moment. And it seems to be sufficient according to our lawyers. But it makes it a bit difficult to deal with exactly these other repositories, which are highly accepted in the community, like for example, Open Neuro, which do not care about this. So they just give free access without authentication to any type of data they receive on their platform. And for us, currently, we break every links with them until our authentication login is in place, which is, of course, a bit yeah worrisome for future stuff if um, other platforms like Open Neuro do not are not concerned really with the data protection in that kind of meta and not even implying these authentication logins so that you know who's accessing your data, who is downloading them and working with them. I think that that's kind of an information which is actually also something which I think is not too much to ask and still makes science very transparent in general. I think a comment was made previously as well in one conversation that um... The open Europe platform is also open source, so it is possible to uh, for for someone to take the lead in that sense. If that is a necessity, then there's interest in importing that to a European environment. That would be possible, or at it's least also containerized. Yeah. So it's it's incredible. We spun up a copy of it. It was it, it took an afternoon. It was amazing. Adam, maybe uh, now that you're um, talking, you had a comment on uh, Andrew's. Uh, yeah, well. regarding the remote environments, I, I, I agree it is nice to have the data, but the remote environments are really getting very impressive. You've got full uh, Jupyter notebooks. I mean, you can you can feel like you have the data on your workshop, and I think you could even make that accessible to people who didn't have access to compute. But in our world, we, I mean, so we live and breathe on the GPUs, and uh, GPUs in the cloud space are extremely expensive. Um, if I looked at the amount of compute that we did over the past year um, and, and looked at it in, in clouds, uh, at cloud rates, even concern, even liberal cloud rates, I think it would be the budget of my entire institute. So I, I don't know how we would do our analysis entirely in remote environments. I do recognize that that is how we're moving, but I'm interested in how other people are addressing this if they're working in the machine learning space. Uh, that's a good question. So, so um, remote environments doesn't necessarily mean cloud. I think actually the most interesting use of remote environments are on-prem to on-prem. So meaning like, you know, one institute's data centers to another institute's data centers, or if I wanted to train a model across data, you know, Oxford, Stanford, and the University of Toronto or something like this. Um, um, and also in, in response to like looking at data, I, I find that um, people people do are interested in looking at data, obviously in, in representative samples, but um, um, once you have access to more than, you know, what, what, I think if if and when this, this does become mature technology, we won't be working with, you know, data on the orders of thousands anymore. You, you, there'll be a lot of studies that's on the orders of, of millions, millions plus. And it's, it's kind of, well, yeah, you want to look at a few of them. But I know like in the in in other uh, domains of, of statistical analysis where they're not as restricted on data because it's not as sensitive. I mean, Im you know, ImageNet, which is a five or 10 year old data set now, um, uh, has what, like 10, how many, like millions of images and many millions of images? Like you're never going to read all of them, right? right. And, but, but I think you can still have like meaningful ways to like request access to look at samples and like, and, like, and all, you, know, you do these kind of consent mechanisms also where the assumption is that you're, you're, you're going to immediately delete it and you're not going to store it at all, but you're just going to be looking at it sort of ephemerally in, in the process of, of doing data science. Um, so I think some of, the, some of these kinks can be worked out. Um, but, uh, is that happening? Is there a possibility for me to use a remote environment but to use my own local compute through some sort of encrypted tunnel or something? Um, so I think that's the promise of, of like homomorphic encryption, which is still still quite challenging. Um, if I were to, if I if you want to do remote um, remote compute, I mean, so doing remote compute on your own hardware, I think is. Uh, Probably less less interesting for you because you already own data sets that are on your own hardware. But for example, if you wanted to work with data, 
in another research institute, they would then have to have their own GPUs, right? So I think um, right. there, there is this, there is an assumption that you have to co like whoever is the owner of the data, if they want to maintain control over the data, uh, probably needs to co-locate it with compute that allows people to actually do analysis with it. And that is like a, that's like a moderate change for some places, but for most research institutes that are doing research on their own data sets anyways, it's not too big of a deal. And also sort of worst case, um, it means that if, if you yourself have um, say sort of good compute that actually people might consider you to be the data custodian um, for a wider variety of data sets on behalf of people who don't have access to as much compute and, and sort of moving it to some maybe one location in the custodian environment is still significantly better than distributing a copy to every single person that wants to work with it. Uh, if sure. that makes sense. Great. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Rubes, you had a comment about uh, the remote environments. Yeah, so it's, um, I think it, I think remote environments are kind of maybe, maybe obviously a very uh, kind of solves the problem when it comes to a uh, traditional idea about what constitutes privacy. But, um, you know, when you were uh, pushing back and uh, against the sort of more conservative definitions of things earlier on, Gustav, I, I, the thought was crossing my mind, well, it's also not just the data of, a, of an individual. It's, sometimes it's just the data of an individual, but most of the time, um, at least some proportion of the people in your sample are in some way um, socially marginalized, right? Even if it's just that half of them are women. And um, we've seen, it just recently, Psychological Science had to retract uh, an article that just made totally unfounded sweeping statements about intelligence in other parts of the world and a really, really rubbish retraction, no apology. I'm really cross about it, but I shan't go, go, go on about it right now. Um, you gave the example of ImageNet and actually ImageNet is actually also kind of a really lovely example of this kind of problem that they're, they're, they're just pictures, right? But some of those pictures are upskirt images. Some of them are non-consensually taken photographs of people sunbathing in, in a bikini. Um, there are sexually explicit images of children that have had to be filtered out um, after the fact, right? So that, that there, are, there are these, there are big, big problems um, with just as, with, with sort of going, well, this data in and of itself, if it's private, if the, if the, if the people who, if the individual person who gave it can't be identified, it can't be used to harm them. Because the reality is, as we've seen over and over again throughout the history of academia, essentially, um, science is and continues to be used as a tool um, to perpetuate the status quo. And that status quo is not one that is open um, in any sense of that word. And I think if we, if we care about the privacy of our participants as individuals, we need, to we need to care about them as groups as well. And this, I mean, the, the, the article in, in Psych Science that was, that was retracted um, was not neuroimaging data, but there was a perhaps less uh, infamous case not that long ago, um, a paper in eNeuro by one Stephen Glisk, um, which used not, not nobody's, nobody's data. I mean, he, I shan't comment on whether or not he would have the capacity to actually run an, an, an analysis on the data, but um, <laughs> he was able to create a story that was convincing enough to get published um, using, using, you know, decent research on trans people, some of it more questionable than others, but overall, basically decent research to then make the case that trans people should be subjected to conversion therapy. And what worries me is that because we have this cult of objectivity in science, where we imagine that because it's lots of numbers, it must be objective, and it isn't subject to our own political biases. It absolutely is subject to those biases. The way that we frame the question, the decisions we make in our analysis pipeline, everything is influenced by our politics and our positionality in society. And if Stephen Glisk had been the one analyzing a trans women that came out of the Karolinska Institute over the last few years, for example, we would have a very different idea in the literature about what trans womanhood is and that in turn would be feeding into all of these um the, the debate that going on in the uk right now where people are talking about bathroom bills and jk rowling is saying that we're dangerous like 
you know, I'm, I'm not saying this just because I'm cross. What I, what I want to say is, you know, when I was thinking about how am I going to make this data on the mental health of trans children available to other researchers in a way that protects those children, I also wanted to protect them politically, not just as individuals who could be identified. And at the moment, I don't see an obvious solution um, within the remote analysis framework to address well, that part of the problem. The remote analysis framework actually makes it easier to support this because, for example, if I give someone a copy of a data set, I have no idea what they're going to use it for, right? They could use it to do all sorts of terrible, horrible things. But if we have, if the data set is simply hosted online and the person who owns it, who's supposed to be defending it, um, um, maintains control over the only copy, then they also maintain transparency over any potential way that someone wants to use data set. I think the best example of this in production right now is uh, uh, GBT3 um, not being released uh, from OpenAI, which allows them to basically see how everyone is using this model um, to prevent misuse. So I think I think uh, this is very much in line with a, a better protections than um, than not non remote execution um, could ever offer. I think I, I wouldn't I wouldn't see this as an argument against uh, the, re the remote analysis approach um i just to me there is that that is a, a very elegant solution to privacy and i'd like to see a a similarly elegant solution to political vulnerability of of groups under study and especially considering as i said at the beginning the group under study doesn't have to be people of color it doesn't have to be a question that's about trans people it could just be that half your sample happens to be women or happens to be people of color or whatever else yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Great. <laughs> Let's find a solution. <laughs> so if I have it correctly, we're actually like two minutes over time at the moment, um, which I am disappointed about because I would like for this conversation to continue <laughs> for the next uh, hour. But um, I think we should round up. Um, just to give people time to uh, to go on to the next OHBM sessions as well. Um, what's a good point here to make is that there is an open uh, or a public channel on Mattermost that we have that we've added uh, all of our speakers to. Um, and um, um, if you have questions, we I didn't actually uh, have time to get to the questions that were asked uh, from the audience, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, it was already quite uh, back and forth fourth year on this one, but I think we have discussed a wide variety of topics here. If people want to ask the speakers individually, um, I asked everyone to be available um, or just to, to uh, uh, join the, the Mattermost channel and I'll, I'll send the details again. Uh, we can share the details in Crowdcast um, as well. And some of us will be joining the OHBM um, uh, program over the next two weeks. So maybe you can corner them somewhere digitally. <clears throat> um, so I would ask maybe for the next minute if if anyone wants to have like a really really short um, like roundup comment um, from from all of our speakers. If you don't want to, uh, never mind. But if you want to, maybe just visu uh, virtually put up your hand. No one yet. Cool. So I'm really glad that we can welcome all of you here. I am slightly disappointed that we don't have enough time to get to all of the more interesting and uh, the rest of the discussions that we really need to have about this. But I think um, let's let's just um, uh, tag each other on the Mattermost channel and, and continue the discussion because I think it's really important and really needed for, for this, not only for this community, but but wider than that. Thanks again to all of the speakers. I'm really glad you joined. Uh, and thank you for all the people who've been watching us. Thanks. Thank you for organizing, Steph. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Oh. Thank you. Bye.